there's a new SpaceX booster in town and it's in line for testing. Well, for many weeks after the first orbital Starship attempt, we've been focusing a lot on the Ship 25 and Booster 9 duo as it's set for SpaceX's next fateful flight. However, besides that, there are still many other notable activities taking place at Starbase. And as normal, after 9, we have 10 obviously, and in fact, most recently, Booster 10 conducted up to two consecutive cryogenic proof tests. SpaceX may be looking to push testing of the B-10 for another orbital flight later this year, if allowed by the FAA. During the test, SpaceX fully loaded the upgraded Super Heavy with a cryogenic fluid, which is likely liquid nitrogen, all with no significant unplanned holds. In those periods, SpaceX likely loaded Super Heavy B-10's liquid methane and oxygen tanks with roughly 3,400 metric tons, or around 7.5 million pounds of liquid nitrogen not far off of what SpaceX's Super Heavy would actually weigh at liftoff. At the peak of the test, Booster 10 was almost entirely covered in a thin layer of ice produced as the cryogenic liquid inside its tanks froze water vapor in the humid South Texas air onto its reflective skin. This effect effectively turns uninsulated cryogenic rockets into giant fill gauges. A propellant load test is a crucial step in the development and testing process of the stainless steel rocket. During this test, the rocket's tanks were filled with the propellants that it will use during its flight. The purpose of the propellant load test is to verify and validate the performance and integrity of the rocket's propellant system. It helps to ensure that the tanks, valves, pumps, and other components involved in the propellant handling process function correctly and can handle the extreme conditions encountered during liftoff and flight. The successful completion of a propellant load test is a significant milestone in the development of a rocket, as it indicates that the rocket's propellant systems have been thoroughly tested and are ready for the next phases of testing, which will include static fire tests during which actual engine ignitions take place while the booster remains grounded. However, in the forthcoming days, SpaceX can conduct testing of this thrust puck on Booster 10. This is because, while Booster 10 rolled out, keen observers noted that both the small chines and the small CO2 tanks had been previously removed, making way for the installation of new mounts to accommodate larger chines, or the point at which the strakes meet, along with some newly integrated vents for the engine section. At the same time, earlier this month, Ship 26 was transported to suborbital pad B for what seems to be static fire testing. This development hints at the possibility that Ship 26, along with Booster 10, might constitute the next next stacked configuration for the third flight. May Starship serve as a beacon of hope for the future. As we witness substantial advancements with SpaceX's Starship, despite numerous explosions during the tests, an acceptable risk for an innovative spacecraft pushing boundaries, the prospect of its successful first orbital launch is becoming an increasingly tangible reality. Consequently, Musk's vision of Mars missions and the establishment of initial settlements begins to transcend the realm of dreams and venture into the plane of achievable objectives. But putting SpaceX aside, let's now talk about how Stoke Space just made history. More specifically, this four-year-old Seattle-based startup executed a successful up-and-down test of its Hopper developmental rocket vehicle today, marking a major milestone in its quest to create a fully reusable launch system. Hopper 2's 15-second flight took place at Stokes, Stokes Test Facility at Grant County International Airport in Moses Lake, Washington at 11.24 a.m. PT. A hydrogen-fueled rocket engine sent the test vehicle to a height of 30 feet, with a landing 15 feet away from the launch pad, Stokes CEO Andy Lapsus shared. It's the last test in our development program for Hopper, and by all accounts, it's been very successful, Lapsa said. With this test campaign, Stoke Space also reached several industry milestones. Stoke conducted the first flight test of a reusable vertical takeoff vertical landing rocket that uses differential throttling for attitude control. The company also conducted the first flight test of a re-entry vehicle that uses an active regeneratively cooled heat shield. Although this vehicle didn't actually directly experience the heat from hypersonic atmospheric re-entry, it has successfully operated at 100% of the expected heat load in a simulated environment. Additionally, they became the fastest company to go from initial seed funding to demonstrate
demonstrating an orbital class vertical takeoff and vertical landing rocket, the second company in the world to fly a prototype of a fully reusable upper stage rocket, and just the third US company to develop a liquid hydrogen rocket engine. Going forward, Stokes' team will concentrate more fully on developing its rocket's first stage and ramping up operations in Florida. The focus is now very centrally on getting to orbit, and the first stage is the most critical part of that, Lapsa said. We will be focusing on first stage engine development. I would say it's a custom designed engine, but in terms of novelty and world first, it's not intended to be one of those. Eventually, Stoke plans to offer a fully reusable launch system, including a second stage, that can be brought back to Earth without having to rely on exotic shielding. The concept behind Stoke Space's launch system has been compared to the much larger two-stage Starship system that's being developed by SpaceX for trips beyond Earth orbit. You can extend that comparison to characterize today's hopper flight as a parallel to SpaceX's Grasshopper test flights back in 2012 and 2013, or the Starhopper tests in 2019. Lapsa said he was incredibly proud of his team. The team is unbelievable, and, you know, we've developed everything. Two and a half years ago, this spot in Moses Lake was a blank desert. Today, we've launched a brand new hydrogen oxygen engine, and it's a very unique engine on a vehicle that took off and landed vertically, he said. I think everybody's on cloud nine. Congrats to them, and moving on to our final bit of news today, there is an amazing otherworldly image captured by the powerful James Webb Space Telescope. The image shows the outflows surrounding a fast-moving newborn star that will someday grow into a cosmic body like the sun. The jets, which are together called Herbig Haro 211 or HH211, live in an energetic pocket of space located about a thousand light years away from Earth in the constellation Perseus. In this region, a protostar is actively sucking in surrounding gas and dust to grow larger, all the while shedding material into space in what astronomers call a bipolar outflow. And as those jets of material zoom through space, the JWST's sharp infrared eye managed to capture their interactions with interstellar matter as bright, colorful swirls. The protostar, which is not seen in Webb's image, is suspected to be a binary star and likely represents what our sun used to be like when it was just a few tens of thousands of years old, with just 8% of its current mass. It'll eventually grow into a star like the sun, JWST representatives wrote in a statement published Thursday, September 14th. Double H211 is one of the youngest and nearest examples of a newer star spewing out matter, so it's an ideal object for the JWST to observe, researchers say. This telescope is unprecedented in its infrared capabilities, which is a game changer for stellar astronomers as it allows them to peer past thick blankets of gas and dust that envelop very young stars. Gaining such access to shrouded stellar bodies ultimately helps scientists decode the object's chemical makeup and behavior. By studying the data about WH211, collected by the Near Infrared Spectrograph Instrument on board the JWST, researchers realized the jets from young stars are much slower and richer in molecules such as carbon monoxide, silicon monoxide, and molecular hydrogen. This is in comparison to the faster jets that blast out of older stars. According to a recent study outlining the JWST's observations of WH211, that's primarily because the shock waves surrounding the young star are not yet strong enough to shred the jet's molecules into individual atoms. WH211 belongs to a group of objects that have been known to evolve rapidly, with gas swirls vanishing only a few years after detection and new ones springing up in seemingly empty regions of space. Well, that's all folks. If you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. As always, this is Kevin from Great SpaceX, and until next time, keep looking up.